Well, I guess the it, it points out what we Republicans have often said about the Demo Democratic Party. You can never get too big. And I'm really predicting whatever happens with Al Gore, Nader's presence, and particularly if it's clear that he's made an impact on this election, will nudge the party even further left. This is, promises to be as, as exciting a post-campaign debate as the whole campaign was. Well, on that uh, point, uh, Nader said a short while ago, Larry King interviewed him earlier, shortly past 10 o'clock this week, we become a viable watchdog party. But a question, a point you were making earlier, Mary, Ralph Nader has set a pox on both your houses. He well, doesn't he, think either Gore or Bush cuts the mustard. Well, there, that was, a, uh, I believe, a cynical strategy of his. Clearly, there were huge differences, and in the end, he was saying, he sort of got in cahoots with Gephardt and the other Democratic leaders to say, vote for Democratic con uh, congressmen and senators. He knows there's a huge difference between them, but he was appealing to that kind of Ventura, that maverick, that... That, indep that independent vote voter who really does uh, have a cynical view about politics in general. Very cynical on, the, on behalf of Ralph Nader, but he knows there's a huge difference. I, 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 I would just remind everyone who voted for Ralph Nader, if over the next four years they have to watch George Bush appoint people to the Supreme Court and to all of the sub-cabinet positions, all of those positions in OSHA and EPA and regulatory agencies that really count in our system of government. They watch how those positions are filled versus how Al Gore would have uh, filled them, then they'll know uh, how they spent their vote this election night. You All know, right. I think a lot of people voted for Bush because of the what he is going to bring into government. Those people that he brought with him on the campaign trail, notably Colin Powell, who will be a typical kind of appointee in a Bush administration. All right, Mary Madeline, Mike McCurry. We've seen you several times. We're going to see you several times more before this night is over. It is, uh, what, 22 minutes? No, 18 minutes before the bewitching hour of midnight, Eastern Time. And uh, we're still counting. There are still seven states, and Jeff Greenfield has his hand in front of my face, so he wants to say something. Jeff. Oh, I'm sorry to be so impolite, but, but, you, but, you know, I just want to point out something a little ahead of time, thanks to our staff. If Al Gore picks up Iowa and the one electoral vote out in Maine and Florida, which and I was about to say that we are giving Al Gore. Okay, then and this I will formally announce. CNN uh, announces we, as we described earlier, Maine is one of the two states that can split its electoral vote by congressional district. We're now prepared to say that Al Gore has all four of Maine's electoral votes. So as you can see, the total there is 231 is this total Gore. Correct? This should it is be the, 232? Or should it be 232? Yeah. It was 231. All right, 232 now. Okay, now, so here's I the point. Corrected. I stand corrected. I'm told that the 231 is correct. Okay. And uh, just uh, at 229, and this is Governor Bush. If, and Jeff, keep talking. If Al Gore wins <laughs> Iowa and, Al, and uh, Al Gore wins Florida and George Bush wins Arkansas and Alaska, we have an electoral tie. 269, 269, no one with an electoral majority, and Come either on. they find an elector to defect or it goes to the House of Representatives. There were more than 70 mathematical possibilities that that could happen, I was told, and we may be facing one of them. Right. And a couple of people have asked me, can George Bush still win without Florida? And the answer is yes, he can. He's at 229 electoral votes right now, and there are still 54, I think without Maine, 53 electoral votes out. He needs 41 more to get 270. So he could win without carrying Florida, but he'd have to carry just about all of the rest of those states, 41 out of the 53 electoral votes in the remaining states, to do it. This, this depends on a split that doesn't is mathematically tricky because Oregon and Washington, uh, I believe, have to also fall into um, Bush's column. But we are looking at a race that is so close, so late, that all of the pre-election predictions in this sense, in this sense, were accurate, which is to say it is unpredictable. That's right. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. And if it is a tie, boy, are we going to have a good time talking about that. <laughs> There'll be a hunt for electors. Each side will be looking for electors because, because look, you know, in December, the electors meet in their respective state capitals to vote. So each side will claim a moral victory if they edged out the other in popular votes, and they'll try to get an elector to defect 
to the winning they side in the popular it, they vote. They won't let it stay a tie, is what you're saying. They, they're going to try not to let it stay a tie the because they're going to say, morally, the person who got the most votes from the people should win. They're going to have to find an elector who will defect. Those electors are chosen for their loyalty. But can you Jeff imagine Green. the onus on the person who made the switch? Well. <laughs> Jeff, how did the electors in your novel turn out? Well, <laughs> my novel wasn't quite as outrageous as what might happen with a tie. <laughs> All I did was kill off the president-elect in a photo opportunity. But the fact of the matter is, the basis of, of all of this argument is that while states can try to punish electors who defect, uh, you know, fines and stuff, mm -hmm. the Congress so far, when an elector has been faithless, has in fact said, no, we're going to count the vote. Now, it's never mattered. But there is some precedent to say if, an, if there's one of these electors, let's say Bush wins the popular vote, and one of these Gore electors says, you know, it's a tie. I think I should go with the popular vote winner. He can be ostracized. He'll probably never get a Democratic Party job. But they can't stop him from casting the vote. And it is a, it is a Congress in January that decides whether the vote is valid. And so far, it looks like it will be a Republican Congress. I'm looking, uh, speaking of a potential tie, I'm looking at the, the Republican pollster, Alex Gage, mm -hmm. working with Fred Steeper, who predicted just this scenario. About a, about a week and a half ago, and he figured it out, and it's, it's, uh, it is coming to, uh, to fruition almost exactly as he predicted. Of course, well, there's still six or seven states out. That's including right. Florida. But, yeah. Yeah. Including Florida, which is a big one. And he had given that to Al Gore, and he still had a tie. Well, that's yes. how it so, works out, and that, if, if Bush takes Florida, I, I, you know, not only will there be a lot of exit poll and people mm -hmm. who may have a new job, but it won't happen Oh boy. Let me interrupt our conversation. Uh, Arizona now, CNN declares, goes to Governor Bush. Arizona's eight electoral votes in the governor's column. Mm -hmm. And that is a significant win because Arizona had voted Republican in every election from 1948 for Harry, uh, since Harry Truman. It voted for Harry Truman, then it voted Republican in every election after that until it voted for Bill Clinton in 1996. And now it's gone back into the Republican column. Home of John McCain. He represents that state in the United States Senate. And, uh, and the primary there, no surprise, uh, John McCain beat yes. George Bush by almost 25 points. Yeah. Actually, what happened in Arizona is interesting because they have a lot of seniors who have retired and live in Arizona. It appears from our exit polling that they voted heavily for George Bush and they put him over. What carried the state for Bill Clinton in 1996 was a heavy vote among Hispanic Americans who voted very heavily Democratic. So you had a Hispanic Democratic vote and a senior vote that was heavily Republican. It appears that the seniors have won at this time. But what will be interesting to find out is why it was took so okay. long to fall into the Bush column. It will be interesting to look at those okay. numbers. We, we, have, we do have the senior vote in Arizona. Let's take a look at what our exit poll showed among voters over 65 in Arizona. They were the key to the Bush victory. 57% of them voted for Bush, 40% for Gore. Now, remember that um, the Social Security issue, the Medicare issue, the prescription drugs issue was supposed to pay off handsomely for Al Gore among seniors. Certainly didn't work that way in Arizona because the seniors in Arizona voted very strongly for George Bush and delivered that state to him. So don't take the senior vote for granted. Even for the Democrats this year, Social Security issue didn't work the way a lot of people predicted. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to hear from, uh, or talk with, I should say, the Republican Speaker of the House of Representatives, Dennis Haster. We'll be back in a moment. The United States of America still does not have a new president at this late hour. Back and forth, nip and tuck. The governor and the vice president have traded the electoral lead. Right now, Governor Bush has gone back up on top, 237 electoral votes to Vice President Gore's 231. This is the electoral map as it stands. This is the raw vote with 66% of precincts reporting. You can see that Governor Bush has 49% of the vote, or roughly 34.2 million votes, to Vice President Gore's 48%, or 33.7 million votes. He's running as the closest since Humphrey and Nixon in 1968, Bernie. That's right, and if that was 66% of the vote, that was about 68 million votes. So it looks like we're going to have a little over 100 million voters mm -hmm. casting ballots. It's a little higher than usual, but not spectacularly high. 
Wolf Blitzer, race is underway in the house. What's the latest? We're taking a close look at the house races. There's one net pickup we can report right now in Long Island. Felix Grucci, the Republican, beating Regina Seltzer. This was the seat that Michael Forbes lost in the Democratic primary. He's the former Republican who turned Democratic. Let's take a look at what we can report on the balance of power in the House of Representatives right now. Very, very close so far. If you take a look at all the numbers, they're still undecided, and there's still about three, the, only about three-fourths of the seats have been determined right now. So far, we can say the Republicans have a net gain of two seats. We're still waiting, Stuart Rothenberg, for some seats out of the West Coast, though. Well, not just the West Coast, Wolf. We've got a, two squeakers in Jersey, one in West Virginia, one in Scranton, one in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where Heather Wilson is in trouble, all across the country. We've got a lot of close ones. We're going to be watching all of those races right now back to the National Desk. All right, Wolf Blitzer, Stu Rothenberg, joining us from yeah, Aurora, he's Illinois, his hometown, the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Dennis Haster. Mr. Speaker, thank you for being with us. As you hear this analysis from uh, Stu and, and Wolf, uh, what's your reaction? Republicans two up net at this point, but we're still waiting for some important races to come in. Well, we're cautiously optimistic. Uh, we have uh, been able to defend our seats in Kentucky and North Carolina that we thought that we ha may have a challenge. Uh, we have an interesting uh, race in Connecticut uh, that we may uh, pick up a seat that we didn't expect. And, uh, you know, we have to go in. I think uh, we're doing as well as we can expect. It's, uh, it's going to be a long night. Uh, we have to see what happens in California, obviously. But I, I feel good about the, the position that we're in. When do you think you'll have a sense of what the new house is going to look like? Well, it might be uh, early tomorrow morning before we really know what the <laughs> how early like. or how late I should say. <laughs> I wish I know. I guess we're all looking at that crystal ball. Yeah. It probably won't be uh, much before we uh, determine who the new president's going to be. Well, speaking of that, uh, we're looking at a very close race. Are you surprised, Mr. Speaker, that we're looking at a race with what 49 percent to 48 percent of the popular vote, and just a few? What is it? 231 Gore to 237 Bush in the electoral vote at this point? Well, we just figured that this was going to be a tough race. We knew it was going to be close. Uh, we figured it was going to be close in the House. It was going to be close in the Senate. It was going to be close in the presidency. Nobody, obviously, in this uh, election period was running away with it, but we've tried to get our uh, themes out there, talking about balancing the budget and paying down the debt and a better education for our kids, and that have been pretty well united our, thematically, and I think that appeals to people. No matter what happens from here on out, it's clear that this country is divided in a big way in terms of its view, not only of the man it wants to lead the country for the next four years, but in terms of philosophy. That being the case, how can the House of Representatives and the Senate do business with a president when the mandate seems to be so split here? Well, you know, that's why we need uh, both in the House of Representatives and the Senate and in the presidency to try to bring people together. You know, the important issues, education, uh, health care, are things that should be partisan. They ought to be bipartisan. And uh, we need to, to be able to bring our arms together and, and get those things done. You know, 90% of the issues in health care, people agree on. We ought to be able to split the difference in the other 3% and get it done. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, when you say it needs to be bipartisan, are you saying that all the fault lies with the other party here? I'm not or? pointing the finger at anybody tonight. Uh, it was pr pretty evident in the House of Representatives this year that the strategy of the Democrats is to try to block everything so that they could run against a do-nothing Congress. We didn't let that happen, but it was awful tough to get anything done when that was the strategy. All right, uh, House Speaker Dennis Haster joining us from his hometown of Aurora, Illinois. We want to thank you very much for being with us, and we look forward to been my pleasure. talking with you very soon again once we know more about what the outcome of the House of Representatives will be. We are going to take a break, and we'll be right back with much more coverage in about two and a half minutes. The last state, the polls close in the state of Alaska. We'll be back in a moment, and with that call. Tomorrow in the Crossfire, join Bill Press and Robert Novak as they take a look at the new administration in the White House. Tomorrow, 7.30 Eastern on CNN. 
CNN Center in Atlanta. Coverage of Election 2000 continues. Here again, Judy Woodruff, Bernard Shaw, Jeff Greenfield, and Bill Schneider. 12 o'clock in the East Coast of the United States, and we are able to make a call in the last state to close its polls tonight. Alaska, the land of the midnight sun, goes to George W. Bush. It's three electoral votes. No real surprise at all here. This state has only voted for a Democratic candidate once since it became a state in the year 1959. So here's the total. George W. Bush, 240 electoral votes. His are the red states on that map. They are from the east almost all the way to the west. Al Gore, 231 electoral votes. The states in blue, counting California, and going all the way over to the state of Maine. Just it is a close, close, close Look at this. Just election. six states left. One of those will put somebody over the top. We don't know who it's going to be. It's amazing. This is the raw vote total at this hour, with two-thirds of the precincts across the United States reporting. Look at that. 49% going for George W. Bush, 35.1 million to 34.57 million. What is that, about 500,000 votes? About half votes. a million votes. 70 them. million votes cast, uh, half a million votes separate. <laughs> them. That's right. Let's uh, see now, when was the last time? Hubert Humphrey and Richard Nixon. Nixon took a half a million vote win. Before and that, you got to go to Kennedy, Nixon. But this is the closest race in 32 years. And who knows, these, it could get closer. These are the states that are going to decide it. Let's take a look. There are six of them that we are not able to call. Arkansas, six electoral votes. Florida, the big McGilla at this point, 25. <laughs> Iowa, seven. Oregon, seven. Washington and Wisconsin, each carrying 11 electoral votes. There are 67 electoral votes up for grabs. And Judy, four of those states were carried by Michael Dukakis, Dukakis in 1988, one of the weaker Democratic presidential candidates in modern times. And Al Gore has not yet been able to put away four of the Dukakis states. We've been looking at that all fall long. It looks like well, it may be pivotal. A lot's why, changed I know why, why are the many reasons <laughs> this, that that's precisely the question of the hour? Why Here's why. Able to do it? A man named Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader is doing very well in Oregon. Well, not very well, but those, he's doing enough votes. Those states are so close between Gore and Bush that the Nader vote, which isn't particularly high, has the balance of power between the two. I wonder if we can, are we able to look at the raw vote totals in some of these states showing the Nader factor? Uh, I'm asking our folks who have control over the graphics that we're looking at. Are we able to see, for example, in Washington, uh, in Wisconsin, uh, what what kind of Nader uh, numbers are there? In time, Judy, in time. But it does indicate... Remember in good we, time, I'm told, that will happen. Remember, we did point to the Nader factor as one of the seven keys to the presidency, and it looks like we were coming down to that to the fact that that question, the answer to the question of how big the Nader factor was in some of these states, may determine who the next president of the United States is. He doesn't look like he's going to get his $7 million, but he may affect the outcome of this entire election. Let's discuss for a moment why there is a Nader factor. That's right. And we think we have some evidence to, that, to this point from the state of Oregon, where Nader's getting 4%. But we asked the Nader voters, how would they have voted in a choice between Gore and Bush? 61% of the Oregon Nader voters said they would have voted for Al Gore. Only 10% for George Bush. And a quarter of them say they wouldn't have voted for at all. That is why the Gore people worried about Ralph Nader. By 6 to 1, his votes would have come from Al Gore, not George Bush. Right now, Oregon, the two of the votes between Gore and Bush are nose to nose. They're very, very close. The Nader voters would, make, would have made the difference for Al Gore, and he would have carried Oregon most likely if Net Ralph Nader hadn't been on the ballot. And his argument during his campaign was that there's no difference, per se, between the Democrats and Republicans. They're dominated by lobbyists and big corporations, and they're not to be trusted. That's right. The argue, if you vote for a third-party candidate like Ralph Nader, you honestly have to believe that it doesn't make any difference which candidate wins, Gore or Bush, that they don't make, they're, they're no different on the issues that are important to you. And the Gore people trotted out a whole lot of reputable liberals like Robert, Robert Redford and Al Franken and Gloria Steinem to say, yes, it makes a tremendous difference, abortion issues, Supreme Court, but apparently there are enough Nader voters remaining who simply agreed with Ralph Nader, it really doesn't make a difference. And that vote swapping that we talked about a little bit earlier going on on the internet across the country, websites where you could go into the website and arrange presumably to trade your vote. Yes. Uh, if you were in a state uh, where voting for Ralph Nader could hurt uh, Al Gore and you didn't want to do that, 
We are now able to say the state of Arkansas is in oh George God. W. Bush's corner, the home state of President Bill Clinton and its six electoral votes fall to George W. Bush, giving the Texas governor an electoral vote total of 246, putting him only 24, 24 votes away and from becoming Florida. the next president of the and United States. And guess how many has 25? <laughs> and Florida, with the state of Florida, if it went to George Bush, he'd be the winner. Or some combination or of these other others. states that we're looking at. So Washington, Wisconsin. Uh, Oregon and, and, uh, and, Iowa. and let's look at that list again. We were just able to take Arkansas off. We are left with Washington and Wisconsin, 11 each, Oregon 7, Iowa 7, Florida 25. Don't tell me this isn't exciting. Notice, though, <laughs> that one of the ways George Bush is inching closer to what he needs is by winning the home states of Bill Clinton and Al Gore. Well, let's talk about which states on this list Al Gore, or rather George W. Bush, is most likely to pick up. We know he's still very much in the running. He's in the running in all of these yeah. states. Washington is a state that Al Gore was given a better shot at going in. And That's I think right. the raw vote numbers we showed a little while ago showed that holding up. Yeah, Washington has voted Democratic actually in the last three elections, like Oregon, including Michael Dukakis, but of course we mentioned the Nader factor. You know, Sam Rayburn used to talk about the 49 states and the Soviet of Washington yeah. because it was considered a very left-wing state. It had a lot of union voters. And if the unions are needed anywhere for Al Gore, they are needed. In, they were needed. The, the polls are closed in the state of Washington. If you are just joining CNN's live coverage of election 2000 in the United States, wherever you're watching from in the world, if you're trying to figure out what is this, these five states with the total 61 at the bottom, those are the only number of electoral votes still outstanding, still at stake. It is very tight between Governor Bush of Texas, he has 246 electoral votes, Vice okay. President Gore has 231. It so is this close, is the 61. Close. Close. And if Jeb Bush to had delivered the state of Florida to his brother, well, he would be president now. Well, well he may yet do that. It's still he outstanding. Hasn't, hasn't, uh, uh, he may. Still much to talk about tonight. Let's go to our two reporters who've been covering, spending the most time with the Gore and Bush campaigns over the last year or so. John King in Nashville, Tennessee. Candy Crowley in Austin, Texas. Uh, John, as you and the, the people around uh, Vice President Gore listen to this talk about these states where Ralph Nader is a factor, uh, what are they saying? Well, certainly they believe Ralph Nader has been a factor, Judy. They do believe they will win Washington and Oregon, but as the Vice President watches the results in his hotel room right now, we're told he keeps getting updates from campaign chairman Bill Daley. This mathematical fact, unless he wins the state of Florida, if our projections hold up, he cannot win the White House. As we just gave Arkansas to Governor Bush, Al Gore can now not get to 270 unless he wins the state of Florida. Now, we're told, he's being told by Chairman Daley and others that they believe Florida can turn around. Governor Bush still leads right now. They're saying the remaining precincts out are in largely Democratic precincts, but that could be wishful, wishful thinking there on the Gore campaign's part, but they must now pull out Florida. Let me give you a quick example of the roller coaster emotions here. Joe Andrew is the national chairman of the Democratic Party. He came out here a short time ago and said he was confident of a Gore victory, confident they would win Florida. Ed Rendell, though, the former Philadelphia mayor and the general chairman of the Democratic Party, already pointing fingers at the Gore campaign. He says they should not have pulled their advertising money out of Ohio. And he says they should have made greater use of President Clinton on the campaign trail, especially in Arkansas, the state we just gave to Governor Bush. Ed Rendell saying they only let the president go there one day. They should have sent him down there for three days or perhaps an entire week. Back to you. You do get the sense the recriminations are already beginning, uh, even though we don't know the outcome yet. Uh, this is uh, going to be a very painful night for the person who loses. We are calling the state of Washington for Al Gore, and it's ele 11 electoral votes. We just heard John King say the Gore campaign expected to win the state of Washington, and we are at CNN now able to give those electoral votes uh, to the vice president based on our uh, examination of exit polling and the key precincts. Now, here's the total. George W. Bush, 246. Al Gore, 242. Right. You just heard John King right. say the Gore people now believe that there is no 
mathematically, statistically, possible way that Al Gore can get to 270 without the state of Florida, unless one of the states that have already been called uh, for George W. Bush is taken back. If, if Al Gore were to win Oregon, Wisconsin, and Iowa, and Florida went to Bush, Bush would win the White House 271 to 267. Let's, you let's, think it can be closer than that? Why don't we go to Hal Bruno and find out? Take us into the voting. Uh, in Florida. In Florida. In Florida, especially in Florida. Well, we can go to Hal. Just to talk We're about coming it. to you now, Hal. Okay. Take us into the voting and tell us what is going on in this Sunshine State. Well, what's going on in the Sunshine State is the closest election anybody has ever seen. Uh, the two-thirds of the vote that's outstanding is right here on the Gold Coast, and that is the Democratic stronghold. Two-thirds of the outstanding vote in Florida is in the Democratic stronghold. Over here in Tampa Bay, which is the swing factor, they're running dead even with each other, Bush and Gore. But Hal Bruno, we did hear Karl Rove say within the last hour or so that the, the, the results that he was getting back from that part of the state, particularly the Gold Coast, gave him reason to believe that they were going to take Florida. Well, that may, he may feel that way, and who's to say he's wrong? Because nobody knows at this point. But that was an hour ago, Judy, and the, the way this, the, the count is going there, it's so close that it literally is changing every few minutes. So, Hal, you're saying the two-thirds of the, the outstanding vote in the Democrat stronghold yeah. stretches from South Miami from Miami North Dade Miami. County. From North Miami up to Fort Lauderdale, up to West Palm Beach. And, and Broward County and, is about 15% of what's outstanding, just and, Broward County alone, and that is the stronghold within the stronghold. And mm -hmm. Hal, you're saying simply that those votes have not been counted yet. That's right. And what, 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 what it comes down to this is it, Florida could go either way at this point. We don't know who's going to win Florida. Right now, our vote total, with 86% of the precincts reporting, George W. Bush has 50%, a little over 2.4 million votes, to Al Gore's 48% a little over 2.3 million votes. It's a 100,000 vote lead for those of us who like our numbers uncooked and raw. And uh, I think Hal Bruno could, you know, he said it perfectly. We don't know how this number turns out because you know where those votes are that yet have yet to be counted. And Hal, what about Florida? Florida still, uh, Florida. Wisconsin still has 11 electoral votes and we're not able to call that yet. Yeah, Wisconsin also has gotten much closer and uh, data is, seems to be dropping off a bit in Wisconsin. Uh, Al Gore is doing better now in Madison. And uh, Nader, let me show you on, on my little uh, machine here. In this area, Madison, which is where the Democrats have to build up their strength, Ralph Nader at one point was pulling about 6 7% of the vote. Now he's only pulling about 3 or 4%. And so that's helping Gore. He's doing much better there. But here's the surprise. Up here in the Northwest, which normally is Democratic territory, up there, George Bush is doing better than anyone ever expected he would do. And the result of that is Wisconsin right now is just simply dead even, too close to call. When you say Nader is falling off, Hal, what do you mean by that? Well, at one point, Judy, he had been running about 6% in Wisconsin. And the last we saw, just a few minutes ago, he was down under 4%, closer to 3%. And that has to help Al Gore. Hal, you are a political walking factotum, formerly ABC News uh, political director, former Newsweek national correspondent covering politics. We're both from Chicago, both from Illinois. Your thoughts, what's going through your mind right now? Well, Bernie, you mentioned Chicago, where we're both from, where we learned to be reporters. And you got to go back to 1960, uh, when the vote was very slow coming in from the west side of Chicago. And it made the difference, uh, and Kennedy won it. No such thing is occurring today. Same thing, though, happened in 1968, where the vote was slow coming not only from Chicago, but also from parts of Missouri. Uh, and again, uh, there's nothing like that happening today in those places. I think the vote coming in slow today is simply because it's, it, it, it's such a complicated thing. I don't think there's uh, anything going on. Well, we, oh. should, we should also mention, Hal, that as we were in Florida, that 
and we should give credit where credit is due. Mary Madeline, hours ago, when the networks had called this for Gore, pointed out that there was a large, a huge absentee ballot uh, vote total coming out of Florida. It now looks like we may have to go to the absentee ballots to find out who is going to win Florida and quite possibly who's going to win the White House. Yeah, Jeff, you're right, because uh, uh, the question Bernie asked going back to those previous elections, absentee voting wasn't the thing that it is today. Today, absentee voting is very important, especially in a state like Florida. And the bad news for the Gore people is when it comes to absentee voting, Republicans generally do better. That's been the pattern. And how long does it take to count those kinds of ballots? <laughs> well, we want to know when we're going to know. Okay. Well, we, we know in Washington it can take a few days. Right. I think in Florida it probably will, will, will come right. a lot faster All than right. that. Well, we we want to go to... We're going okay. to Larry King yeah. in Washington, Washington who has someone from the Gore campaign, a very particular someone. Larry. Thank you, Bernie. Our panel will resume in a little while. Ann Richards, Howard Baker, and Bob Woodward. But right now, we'll go to Nashville. Mark Fabiani, a very familiar face now on the American scene, the Gore Deputy Campaign Manager for Communications. We have four states left. Florida appears to be the key. What do you hear? It Mark? is. Uh, you said it all, Larry. Florida is the key. It looks like the candidate who wins Florida will be the next president of the United States. Uh, it's going right down to the, the wire. It's white knuckle time here. Uh, you know, the, all the networks called Florida for Al Gore earlier in the evening, uh, and we think it's going to end up with Al Gore. As uh, you guys just mentioned on your broadcast, two-thirds of the outstanding votes in Florida are from the Democratic strongholds in that state. When those votes start rolling in, Al Gore is going to go ahead. And the prediction that CNN and everyone else made earlier in the evening, Florida for Al Gore is going to come true, and Al Gore will be the next president. How about the large amount of absentee ballots, which was also discussed, and which they also say usually go Republican? I think that's an oversimplification this year. In Florida, a lot of senior citizens vote absentee, and senior citizens in Florida are especially concerned with Governor Bush's plan to privatize Social Security. So we'll hold our own with the absentee ballots this year in Florida, and with the Democratic strongholds uh, yet to be counted in the state, we're very hopeful that uh, by the end of the night, Florida will be uh, where it started the evening with all of your projections, right with Al Gore. Are you uh, angry at anyone over those <laughs> early projections? How do you feel? How does the candidate well, feel? Well, it, <laughs> it's, it's hard to be angry with people. You wonder what happened. You had every single network, uh, people who have been projecting uh, elections for years and years and years and doing a very good job of it, all unanimously predict Florida for Gore. And I think you guys did so for good reason. The exit polls all showed Gore well ahead by three or four points. Um, and the fact is that Bush is slightly ahead there now, but only because the Democratic strongholds in the state, Dade County and Broward County, still haven't had their votes counted. And when those votes are counted, Gore will go back ahead, and uh, the networks will be proven to be right belatedly, mm -hmm. but uh, right nonetheless, and Al Gore will win Florida. You will still need, though, one of the other three, will you not? Iowa, Oregon, or Wisconsin? I believe that's correct. One of the yes, other sir. three. Wisconsin, they're reporting dead even. Oregon a little too early, and Iowa dead even. So even though if That's you win correct. Florida, you still got to win one of the other three. That's correct. But we feel good about our chances in the other three. Those three states, as you've pointed out before, are traditionally Democratic states. And uh, one of them will certainly break in our direction, if not more than one. Uh, it all comes down to Florida. And uh, we're waiting anxiously for the results. Uh, and we're, we remain very hopeful. As our anchors have pointed out, why do you think your candidate has not done as well in, say, Iowa and Wisconsin, two states traditionally Democratic. Well, Why is I think, that so uh, close? As you I think, as you pointed out, uh, Ralph Nader has hurt uh, in Wisconsin. He's taken some of the vote that would normally go uh, to the vice president. Uh, and I'm not sure about Iowa. I'd have to look at those numbers, and I'm sure uh, smarter people uh, than I am will take a look at those numbers and figure that out. But the bottom line is those states, uh, one of those three states, uh, that you mentioned will break in our direction. And when we win Florida, that'll make Al Gore the next president. D is there any chance you see this going into tomorrow or Thursday? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, that's a very good question, Larry. It certainly could go into tomorrow, uh, especially if there are a lot of absentee ballots in Florida. Um, and I don't think you're going to be able to tell who's going to win this election until you can tell who wins Florida. So it's all in the hands of uh, whoever it is in Florida that's counting all these votes. Thanks very much, Mark. We'll stay close. Let's Thank go you, now Larry. to Austin, Texas. Good to see you. Good seeing you. Representative of the uh, Bush campaign, Ed Gillespie. 
What's the mood there? Have you heard what Mark had to say, Ed, that it's all up I, to Florida? I, Do you agree with that? I heard part of it. Uh, not entirely, Larry. Uh, we feel good about Florida, by the way. We're, we're outperforming our vote goals in Duval County by about 44,000 uh, votes and Clay County just south of there by uh, about 7,000 votes. So uh, we are optimistic about Florida this evening. But there's still some things, uh, as you know, earlier in the evening, Florida was being called uh, for Vice President Gore. That's looking like that's going to actually end up being called for Governor Bush. We're optimistic. But for example, in New Mexico right now, there are 98% of the votes are in. Uh, and we are down by 1,000 votes, but there are about 96,000 absentee and early ballots that have yet to be uh, counted and opened, but they're identified by party, and 44,000 of them are Republican absentee and early ballots, and 40,000 uh, of them are, are Democrat. That's a 4,000 advantage. We're down 1,000. Oh, uh, and so if the, if the independents uh, break the way they have during the course of the day, we will end up carrying New Mexico. It's blue so, on the map on the networks right now, but it's not likely mm -hmm. to stay that way. Are you saying, Ed, that you might lose Florida, Chance, no, and sir. still win? Well, no, if you say I, you I, win I, Florida, it's, why even bring up New Mexico? If you win Florida, you win. Well, because I think it's important. I mean, every, every uh, electoral college vote counts, and the, uh, the people in New Mexico ought to know that, uh, that they're very much uh, likely to end oh, up but, in the in the. But Bush then you column. are but, saying but, you, you've won this election because you're going to win Florida. So, I mean, New Mexico is interesting, but only interesting. You've won Florida. It's, uh, I'm not saying we've won Florida at this point, Larry. I'm saying that we're, we're outperforming our, our vote goals in a number of critical counties, and we're optimistic about it at this point in the night. What do you make of this whole night, and how's the candidate holding up? Uh, he's holding up great. Uh, he's obviously with his family and, and watching the, uh, the tallies and, and very much looking forward to, uh, to having the, come to a successful conclusion. We're optimistic. We will have no mandate this evening, and we obviously have a split nation. What do you make of this? Well, look, this is a, a, was always going to be a close contest. It's, uh, the, the office of the presidency was an open seat. Uh, it doesn't happen that often in American politics. Uh, we have two new uh, generation, two baby boom generation uh, leaders as the, as the heads of their parties. And uh, the, the issues, people are, uh, you know, there were no, uh, no economic crisis. Uh, we're at peace. And so, uh, so the, the electorate was actually uh, in, a, in a fairly uh, uh, content uh, mindset. And so, mm. so uh, this, uh, this race was always going to come down close. But I think that the governor's agenda that he laid out of saving Social Security, improving public education, modernizing Medicare, uh, restoring our military readiness, and providing some tax relief to America's families, uh, he'll have a mandate if, if uh, we end up with, uh, with 270 electoral college votes tonight. But it can't, it can't be a mandate if one person has 50.2% of the vote and one has 49.8%. Well, I think that, uh, that uh, we'll see how the, how the uh, Congress shapes up and, and uh, what, how they view it. Uh, Ed, uh, anything tonight surprise you? Uh, <laughs> well, there, there have been surprises throughout the night. Uh, uh, but, uh, What's, did any state surprise you? Uh, did any state surprise us? No, we, you know, we were uh, and are still in play in a lot of uh, states that have been traditionally uh, Democratic. Uh, I see that Arkansas just came in recently, uh, Tennessee, uh, uh, West Virginia. These, are, these have been traditionally Democratic-leaning states, and, and so we were uh, hopeful about being able to carry those states. Uh, but uh, we, weren't, we certainly weren't taking anything for granted there. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you. Ed, Ed Gillespie, spokesman for the Bush campaign, two very confident spokespersons, and both saying they're going to win Florida. And uh, we'll return it now. We'll be back with our panel in a little while. Let's go back to Atlanta and Judy. All right, Larry, what a night, what an election, what a count. We're going to look at two of the four states that we are still not able to call and look very closely at the raw vote. Right now, the state of Wisconsin, the Badger State, Al Gore has 48%. Again, this is 64% of the precincts reporting Al Gore with 48%, George W. Bush with 47%. You can see why this election is so close. In the state, and continuing in the state of Wisconsin, we're going to look at the Nader uh, vote. N Ralph Nader is pulling 4% while there is less than a one percentage point difference between George Bush and Al Gore. Uh, Ralph Nader has 64,000 votes. That would probably give the state to him. Now let's go to Oregon. Oregon, Judy. again, 49%, uh, half, half the precincts reporting. Less than 1%, about 1% of the votes separating Al Gore and George Bush. But now let's look at the Nader vote and the Buchanan vote and the vote for John Hagelin, who is the Natural Law Party nominee. Yeah. 
in Oregon. Okay. We will check on those numbers. We're not able to bring them to you right now. We have to pull up an entirely separate uh, graphic there, if you will. Our apologies. We'll try to do that. When we come back, we're going to take a break and look even deeper into these numbers. We'll be back. <laughs> decision has already been made. The votes have been passed. They just have to be tabulated. Um, it's 1225 in the morning. Thank you. It is a close, close election, and we're down to four states. We don't know the results of the electoral, of the outcome in those states. Let's look at what the states are. In Oregon, with 49%, almost half the precincts reporting, there is a two percentage point separation, 48% for George Bush, W. Bush, 46% for Al Gore. And now let's look at what Ralph Nader is drawing, 4%, 32,000 votes. Way more than the margin. Way more yes. than the margin, if you assume that most of the Nader votes would come from Al Gore, which is an assumption that some people will make, others may disagree. Yes. In the state of Iowa at this hour, the 80, with 84% of the precincts reporting, Al Gore is ahead by one percentage point, 562,000 votes to 551,000 for George W. Bush. And look, Ralph Nader, 2%. In other words, if you assume most of those votes come from Gore, as our exit polls are showing, Gore's only up by 11,000. You could probably add another six to 10,000 votes to his lead That's safely. Right. That's right. And in the state of Florida, the one we've been looking at all night long, look at this, 86% of the precincts reporting. At this moment, George Bush 50% to Al Gore's 48,000, 2.4 million to 2.3 million. And now let's look at the other names on the ballot. Ralph Nader, 2%, drawing 78,000 votes. Gore is losing by 103,000 votes. Nader's drawing 78,000. You figure without Nader, it would, it would be even closer than... Uh, than it is now. But the only right. state where we can calculate that Nader is clearly tilting the state marginally to, to George W. Bush is Oregon. Oregon. Pat Neal is in Washington at Nader's campaign location. Pat? Well, as you were talking about, Oregon is the key here. In Oregon, it appears now that Nader has about 4% of the vote, according to some of these exit polls. Now, Nader is particularly strong. He's just come to the podium here talking about the strength of this growing Green Party to talk about how people needed to sit up and take notice of this Green Party. Now, people in Oregon understand this. He is particularly strong in the areas of Portland, Eugene, Salem, the Willamette Valley, all the way down to Ashland near the California border. There are issues out there that have gone on for some time that Nader has been involved in, environmental issues, the idea of breaching those dams to save the salmon, also, the fact that one thing we need to point out, that Nader polled 4% uh, in 1996 in Oregon without ever campaigning there. So that is a key factor there. Also, we've looked at Washington State, what he's done there. Also, Florida, as you mentioned, 2% of the vote in Florida. Now, Nader was just in Florida on Saturday night, uh, rallying the people, getting them excited, and getting people to go out and vote for him. He has been here, he's come back in, as we mentioned now, and telling people that, as we said, that this Green Party is something to be reckoned with. Bernie? Okay, Pat Neal, I'm wondering, has Ralph Nader privately or any of his people in the campaign had anything to say other than what Nader has claimed, that he's not being a spoiler, he's not raining on Al Gore's parade, he won't cause him the election? Well, he has said all along throughout this campaign, and they are saying privately as well as publicly, that Al Gore, if Al Gore loses this campaign, it was because of Al Gore. It was not because of Ralph Nader. He has said this repeatedly. He has said this defiantly down to today, that uh, he is pulling votes because of his popularity, and it does not have anything to do with Al Gore. Actually, the Nader people have said that they expect and they predict 40% of the vote for Nader would have been people who never would have gone to the polls at all. Okay, thank you, Pat Neal at uh, Ralph Nader's headquarters uh, in Washington, Judy. All right, uh, Ralph Nader, I'm looking at a quote from him when he singled out the Democratic Party, uh, the campaigning he's done throughout this year. He called it a hollow party that tells labor unions, minority groups, and its progressive members, you've got nowhere to go because we're not as bad as the Republican Party. All right, we're going to go back to Washington now to our own Larry King. Larry. 
Thank you. Get back to our outstanding panel. They are the Honorable Ann Richards, the former Democratic governor of Texas. She's been with us all night, as has Howard Baker, the former Senate Majority Leader and former Chief of Staff in the Reagan administration. And Bob Woodward, the Pulitzer Prize winning assistant managing editor of the Washington Post. Okay, we're down to four. We had the misread on Florida. What do you make of it, Ann? Well, he has to win Florida, right? Yeah. You're a guy. Yeah. He got to win Florida. And, and he ought to win Oregon. Is, is, and if he does, we win. If Nader, he doesn't, we lose. Is Nader costing him it tonight? I think that, I think Nader is cutting into him, but I don't think he's going to cost him the vote. Senator. I don't think so either. I, I think that, uh, it, it, to begin with, it's a remarkable election. <laughs> I have yes. never seen anything like it, and frankly, I did not think it would be this close. But in the final analysis, it does come down to Florida and perhaps one other state, and I, I, that's just the way it is. And on Florida, with so many absentee ballots to be counted, I would bet, Larry, that it's tomorrow before we have a read on who's, uh, it's already tomorrow. 25 minutes, uh, that's right. tomorrow. <laughs> unless, unless the uh, governor were to win the other three states. Exactly. And but, therefore uh, win it without Florida. But Florida really is key, and it's going to be tomorrow in all likelihood before we know the result of that. Now, there are all sorts of combinations where one or the other could win, but without Florida, it becomes extremely unlikely. How big a fuss, Bob, will this misread make? Well, tomorrow. Uh, uh, you, you, the, you mean headlines. the initial yeah. uh, miscall on Florida? This, this would be a whole different picture yeah, right you, now. You can't tell, but I mean, the difficulty right now is yet a, another misread. Clearly, there are very few votes that are the difference between victory and defeat here. Absentee ballots floating around. Uh, the Bush campaign spokesman was making a good case. It seemed that maybe New Mexico was still in play. So uh, somebody is likely to come out with the Dewey beats Truman headline mm -hmm. and have to take that back. But I don't think the question is going to be the missed call. I think the question is going to be if there were irregularities. When you've got a vote that thi is this close and you have as much money and time and effort invested, there are going to be some deep discussions about what took place in Florida. Missouri might change with St. Louis voting well, late. It, it certainly might. Let, let, me, let me lovingly disagree with Ann about that. I don't, I don't think we've seen any signs of irregularity. And even if there were, I'm reminded of that judgment that Richard Nixon made when he chose not to contest the election. Uh, and, and, you know, there were patent irregularities in the Illinois result at that time. I, I really do think that regardless of who wins, Gore or Bush, that the nation will unite behind them. I think they will have a mandate with the United Nations oh. the day after the election. And the loser will. And I think the loser certainly ought to and almost certainly will coalesce behind the new leader. Is this a case, Bob, where the media, the mainstream, as some critics call it, media, was key wrecked? They said we'd be up late. A lot of the others said, nah, it'd be over by 7.38. We'd be up late. We wouldn't know. Closest election ever. Well, it turned out right. much more so, and I mean, it, it seems to be narrowing in a very bizarre way. A close uh, popular vote. I, I mean, what, what Howard Baker says is correct, but also it would really be nice when the election is over and everything is counted that there is clarity. It will be so much nicer if one candidate emerges and there is not this kind of ambiguity that lingers for decades as it did in the Nixon uh, Kennedy race of 1960. It's not going to happen, though, is it, Ann? The it's other too thing close to that, remember, man. though, Larry, is that there's uh, some other elections taking place. The Senate is very, very close. The House is very, very close. I mean, regardless of what happens later on, both of those bodies are going to be so tightly de at between the two parties and this election being this close, believe me, government ain't going to act a whole lot. Uh, the key then for the country is what do we do, Howard? Let's take this as a fact. Half this country is in one corner and half is in another. How do they govern? Well, they do govern because the country's built that way. And I compromise, compromise, I, compromise. Well, perhaps. But I think, I think whichever man is elected president will have a period when there is cooperation with the Congress, and he'll have his opportunity. Some call it the first hundred days, and but anyway, he'll have a period when he'll have his own mandate, and he'll be able to do a lot. And the country will demand that. I think if, if, if Congress and the president, whoever that president is, decides to go to war instantly, that the country would come down on them like a ton of brick. I just don't think it'll work that way. What do you think? 
Well, well, I think the interesting question is, what is the message that the public and the voters are trying to what send? And the message is, to a certain we extent, know. we don't want too much governing. We don't want anyone to have a mandate. There is enough we uncertainty. Well, we, we want Social the military. Is a federal <laughs> we want the checks to go out and the yeah. mil military to function. But the programs that were presented by Bush and Gore, no one swallowed them whole. No, no one has a mandate, and maybe that's the essence of what's being said here. Let's be careful with new programs and new spending, and it's, it's the old Howard Baker theme, less government. Careful doesn't forge great leadership, though, does it? Well, it, it doesn't. Uh, careful it, leadership. Yeah, it doesn't allow you to step out and become a great leader. It does allow you, though, to be selective in the issues that you're going to push, and I think that that's what's going to happen whichever one of these men becomes the president. They're going to refine these issues down to one or two or maybe three because it will be very difficult in a divided Senate and a divided House as close as it is to be able to go with any large expansive program. In a sense then, Senator, the public is sending these two men a message. Yeah, it is. The public sent a very clear message and the message in my view was not much difference in what you're saying. Maybe technical differences in programs, but you're essentially saying the same thing. Not much difference in what you're proposing. There are significant differences, but that wasn't the determining factor. They chose this election on the basis, really, in my view, of who they instinctively thought would make a better president. And you know, Larry, that's as good a way to judge a presidential 